Welcome to Behind the Muscle Podcast. Today's guest is an IFBB Pro bodybuilder and founder of Pride Foods. Today's guest is Sean Vasquez. Sean, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, man. Good morning. Good morning. For sure, Sean. So I'm excited to chop it up with you. I've got two questions I kind of like to ask all of my guests just to kind of kickstart the conversation. The first question I have for you is who are a few of your favorite bodybuilders of all time? Hmm. Yeah, that <clears throat> that's evolved. I think, you know, starting out, I got into it when YouTube was getting really popular. Um, I don't even know if, if it's Machiavelli, the mo motivation. It might have been uh, it might have been him. A lot of the videos that I got into. Young, I really liked like Sean Ray, Kevin LeBron, uh, those type of bodybuilders, that era. And then YouTube, I got into it. I started watching the videos. I even used to uh, uh, get those those videos that I watched so much, so much, so often. And I made them into MP3 files and I would put them on like my iPod. And like my music wasn't music. It was those videos and I could visualize like them training or whatever. And uh, a guy that was always on there, which um, I've, you know, I, I don't know if we call each other friends now, acquaintances, but um, I speak to him so often now with the business, Jay Cutler. And I, I became a huge fan of him and just the kind of the way he would just go into his training camp. Like he would look like Rambo, right? Like all that stuff just go away. He would even train at, uh, I think, really late at night or even in the morning to uh, elude the crowd, but it was usually just him and Carrie. Uh, I believe that was her name, Carrie, his ex-wife. And uh, he would just, it was just laser focused, right? And um, how that's evolved to now, which I really, really like is he does the same thing with business, right? Um, and he sets that, he sets that standard on how to, how to interact with his fans and customers and, and, and followers and everybody. Um, and I've, I've I extremely respect that about him and his physique obviously speaks for itself. So of all time, it has to be for him, but my perspective has changed now that I'm a business owner. Um, and then our interactions together um, have been nothing, uh, nothing but great. So it's gotta be Jay the, at the top of that list. Very cool, man. Yeah. There was, you can't go wrong with uh, the, the Jay Cutler, Ronnie Coleman DVDs, you know, back in the early two thousands, it, it's definitely iconic. So um, cut above. Um, yeah. I'm kind of curious, Sean, um, at what age did you start lifting weights? And then why did you start lifting weights at that age? Sure. I think uh, as most teenage males in, in Texas, you know, football was uh, right next to, to church. And so I started training probably in high school, strictly just for football. There were actually a lot of strong kids. Um, or I should say more muscular kids uh, in my high school. And so I did start looking up to, to that aspect of like lifting weights and training, but I have to um, have to mention growing up, you know, I, uh, my dad was an over the road truck driver and um, I had to work with him a lot. We, we, we lived out on a few acres in the country, um, not really having much and everything we had, we had to you know fix with our hands or you know, just work really. Um, I stayed a lot at some uh, at my cousin's house they lived uh, further out in the country on a ranch. And so I was always working there. So I was always, I was always smaller. So in high school, I was about 135, 40 pounds soaking wet. And, uh, but I was always strong just cause we're just working, working, working. Right. Um, and then high school started training. I, I remember I was pretty good at squatting. That's about the only thing, everything else I was horrible at. And then when I, uh, I joined the army at 18 and I just, I was really, I was always athletic. Basketball was my thing. Uh, and that's where I really transitioned from kind of playing sports, running, doing different things like that to wanting to put on a little bit of muscle. And I got into to training at that point. Um, and that's, that's what sparked my interest, the, you know, the magazines and obviously the YouTube we talked about kind of just uh, cascade from there. Very cool. And, and we're going to get uh, deeper into your story. Um, but before we do, Sean, uh, talk to us a little bit more about your upbringing. You just kind of mentioned growing up in Texas, you played sports. Your dad was a, a truck driver, but um, tell us just a little bit more in de detail about your childhood. Talk a little bit more about maybe uh, sports and how they helped you, how they influenced you. Talk about any, anything uh, in terms of siblings and maybe some of those influences 
that your parents had on you, please? Yeah, so I, uh, yeah, I, I, I haven't talked, I haven't spoken much. I'm always fumbling over my words. I haven't spoken much about my childhood openly. Uh, to my group, my, my small circle, uh, they, they know everything. But um, so forgive me if I fumble a little bit, but um, my upbringing is not the, the most glamorous. Um, my mom was, she was murdered when I was three. She was shot and killed. Um, I had two step moms come in through through right after that and then through later years later years um i call it the uh alphabet abuse you know we were not just me right i can't i can't just own this but we were all all subjected to the alphabet abuse anything from physical emotional um verbal sexual uh abuse and uh neglect um and without you know, before going forward you know, my, my dad is, is still alive and we, we talk, um, on occasion now he's changed a lot of his ways. And now that I'm older, um, yeah, I don't know if I'm more wise, but I try to, I try to think I am, but more, more importantly, that I'm a father, I, I view things a lot different. And where I was younger, I had a lot of animosity and frustrated, you know, frustration toward him. As I gotten older, I, I learned that that doesn't serve me. I also learned that we, we, we all make mistakes and I'm, you know, I'm not going to make the same mistakes that, that I was subjected to as a kid, but I am a father and I am going to make mistakes. Um, and so it kind of gives me a different perspective. So I don't say these things to, to speak ill about him or the situation. Cause it wasn't just him. It was kind of a cumulative, but, um, it is what it is. And it, it, it was my life, right? I can't, I can't hide it. I can't run from it. But, um, yeah, so at the age of three, he, he attend, essentially, I don't know if this is a good or a bad thing, but kind of kidnapped me and hid me because my grandparents were going to take me after my mother was killed uh, to California. And, you know, back then it wasn't as easy to find people. So <clears throat> he took me and, and kind of hid me away for a little bit. And then, um, yeah, that's where kind of things kind of spiraled out of control for, I guess, probably the most part of the next 15 years until I left. And then they spiraled out of control within you know myself, but um, there were some there were some definite good times there. Uh, I will say that as much as um, there were times where I, I you know wanted to escape and run away, and uh, they were just bad. Um, there were a lot of things. There were some things that my dad did teach, uh, instill in me respect, uh, work ethic, um, discipline. No, I don't know discipline. Respect, work ethic. Um, some of those attributes that I feel maybe lost amongst uh, some kids today. So I am grateful for some of those things, but, um, yeah, sports, how that kind of interjected, um, early on to kind of help probably was until I was my freshman or sophomore year. Um, there was a coach, coach Beatrick. He came in, he was from Post Texas and, uh, he had played basketball at UTSA and it was his first coaching job. He came in. And for whatever reason, I gravitated toward him, um, a positive male role model, whatever it was. I'd gotten really um, interested in, in basketball, but I was I was pretty awful. And um, he was so influential. My. I believe my seventh, eighth grade or my eighth grade. Yeah, my seventh, eighth grade year, I spent the entire summer. Um, so we lived in the country and I had my brother lived in town because he had already moved out at the age of 16 from our house trying to get away from everything. And so um, I would somehow find a way from in the summer from our house, which was about 13 miles out of town into town and stay with him. And I would just, I'd go up there in the morning and I, I there was a basketball court outside and I would just start playing uh, so much so that like I, all the leather from that ball, cause it was an asphalt, you know, uh, court was gone by the end of summer, but I slept with that basketball, everything. But I remember what my coach told me, he's like, if you can increase your ball handling skills, you know, you'll be my point guard. And so uh, that's all I did all summer, every day without fail. He would, you know, he would drive cause they still worked. Obviously we were in summer. He would drive by in the morning, wave at him and he'd go to lunch and then he'd come back and then he'd leave for the day and I'm still there playing. Right. And, uh, longer the short, I came back that next season and I had tremendous ball, you know, ball handling skills for, for, especially for that age but I couldn't hit the broad side of a barn. I couldn't shoot for if my life depended on me, which we eventually developed that he helped me. But um, more importantly from that whole situation, it became extremely impactful for me as 
I progressed in, uh, in high school, it got to the point where he would even pick me up. Um, let's say if we had practice in the morning or we had practice late at night, he would pick me up and or drop me off. We would have, you know, discussions and, and talks and stuff. And so um, he actually messaged me the other day, um, checking in on me, see how we're doing. We don't talk that often, but um, I, you know, football and basketball, a lot of the, he had to obviously coach both sports. I'm rambling here, but he was a huge impact for me. And uh, I didn't realize that until probably maybe seven, eight years ago, how impactful he really was, you know? Very cool. Um, I want to ask you, what was it specifically about basketball that you just found so much uh, thrill or uh, enjoyment from Sean? So my brother actually played in high school and um, because, so my dad was an oil field worker um, before I could even remember him being an oil field worker. He had an accident uh, when he was out there. It, it removed most of his heel. So they had, you know, back in the 80s, they had to replace it with what they could. And so he couldn't stand anymore. So then he got into truck driving. And from there, he, I mean, well, I'm sure oil field workers are gone all the time, but he would be gone from three, four in the morning. And when he got home, it'd be just before dark and he'd go straight outside to working just like his dad, my grandpa. And so it got to the point where he was gone so much that I, my, my brother kind of stepped in as that role model. And so I was with my brother everywhere and basketball was his thing. So because basketball was his thing, you know, basketball was my thing. And that's that's what kind of sparked it. And then um, I was I was of the Jordan. I was of the era of the most uh, of the, the best basketball player ever, period, uh, Jordan. So watching those games with him and all that excitement you know, I just, it was the seed that was planted and, and I just took it from there. Love that. Yep. I, I uh, grew up with the, the Jordan Bulls and uh, I, I don't, I don't think we're going to see anything like that in terms of an individual, but also, you know, a team. So, uh, so definitely, definitely some good memories for myself too. So um, let's talk about, uh, you mentioned uh, joining the army at 18. So uh, tell us a little bit, Sean, where did um, the thought of the military even come to be for you when you were in high school? And then why don't you talk about that decision of deciding to uh, enlist in, in the army when you were 18, please? Uh, out of necessity, out of desperation, really. Um, as, as you can probably, and, and the listeners can tell that things were kind of, there was no rhyme or reason and kind of all over the place, right? So shortly after high school, I'd moved to San Antonio. Um, to figure out what I wanted to do there, right? I think I followed a girl there. She was going to school at the time and she had her shit together. I was lost still. Um, ended up having to come back home for a moment of time. Uh, realized that that wasn't going to work. Had some conflict with my dad again uh, on a dime. I guess I have to be completely honest, right? So yeah, we had, we had a, a little bit of a, a conflict. Uh, I finally physically stood up to him. We didn't fight or anything, but it almost got to that point. And um, I had already been talking to my sister about moving to Washington. She uh, was she in the army at the time? I can't, she was out. She had ETS, but her husband at the time was still in the army. We're in Washington State, Tacoma, to be exact. And um, I was already kind of tossing around the idea. I got to get out of here. I got to get away. This is not good, right? I need to just completely start over. We had that falling out. <clears throat> And uh, the next day, or maybe then right then and there, I pretty much, uh, this is funny as it is. So I had an old pickup, a 1984 GMC pickup, right? No, it had no radio, no cell phone charger, no AC, right? It was a fire department. It was a work pickup back then. And my, we live in the country, so we had a big ditch. And I had a motorcycle. So I backed the truck into the ditch because I didn't have a ramp pulled up the motorcycle, ratcheted it down, threw everything I had in there. I even threw a long sheet of like plywood so that that could be my ramp if I had to uh, unload my bike somewhere because what I decided to do with like $1,000 in my account, I was like, screw this. I'm getting the hell out of here, right? We didn't have Google Maps. We didn't have MapQuest, this, that. So I look up the directions. I also buy a map, but the plan was, and it went through, I drove from Texas to Washington state, um, with a thousand dollars in my account. Uh, that was it. No insurance on the vehicle, no registration. I did have a license, but no 
phone charger, no radio, just me and myself, right? And uh, so I drove to San Antonio that night, st- stayed with a friend, and then I took off the next day. I drove I-10 all the way to Los Angeles, LA all the way up to, um, to uh, Tacoma, sleeping at gas stations, rest stops, you name it, right? Uh, ended up running out of money pretty much as I got there. Um, and as I, as I said, you know, my childhood didn't just happen to me. It was happened to my siblings as well. I had uh, three half sisters and one, one uh, half brother. So my sister is going through her, you know, her stuff as well. And so she didn't have it all figured out. Um, She's, she's uh, a new mother. She has a brand new baby. Her husband is back from a second deployment. I believe they're in an apartment. It's just not the best situation. Some things transpire there. I run out of money. I had a job interview. I don't really have time to start accruing money. Like I'm, I'm just lost. Well, the natural, you know, and by the way, I'm pretty much starting to, star i'm getting pretty hungry just you know simply that and she talks about the army her husband is is still in the army and i'm like yeah that sounds good right i mean i've always thought it was kind of cool i don't know anything about it um i got to back up and prior to this i had uh i wanted to go to college and play basketball upstate in the same general area but i was so worried about leaving. I had no, I had no idea on how to pursue that. I was uh, uh, approached by a coach who ran a basketball camp. They call it a basketball college uh, in Austin that I attended. And he wanted me to go to school there for them. I had no idea on how to do it. Um, he was still in communications with me because I was still fresh out of high school. But um, despite me being up there, I, I still, I was I felt like the army was like where I I needed to go to in order to kind of move forward for me. So we, uh, we went to MEPS. I went to the recruiter, went to MEPS. uh, And we were, I I think I passed everything obviously. And I think I was gone in like a week, week and a half. Uh, And the biggest thing was, is we we went up there. They were like, yeah, we're going to give you lunch. And I'm like, Oh, I get to eat, you know, I get to eat. So like, hell yeah, let's do that. So, um, yeah, it's not some glamorous like call to action. Not af- it was after 9-11, but I didn't even understand what 9-11 was, right? There's so, so many external things that were going on in life. But for me, it, since the age of as early as I can remember, it's just been about survival. And, you know, I didn't realize that until a couple of years now as well. And so there wasn't any, uh, any you know, cool story to that, I guess you could say. It was basic out of necessity, but it happened to be the best thing that ever uh, ever happened to me and that, that I pursued. Hmm. So, so talk to us then a little bit more in depth about some of those experiences you had, and you just said it was, you know, the best thing and one of the best things ever happened to you. Um, talk, talk to us, uh, in terms of why that is, please. Yeah. So all the kind of quirky call outs that you get when people talk about military, right. Uh, cleanliness, discipline, um, accountability, all these things. Um, I, I did not have, uh, I, I can't tell you some glamorous, um, or some heroic, uh, story about going to you know, the Middle East, Afghanistan, Iraq, whatever. Um, I actually missed three division deployments while I was at 101st, which happens to be uh, a very large, um, military base. And, um, the entire division deployed three times. My unit was not yet ready to, to, they didn't have enough personnel and or equipment to be deployed. I did at a young age, just being young and dumb, I continued to volunteer with other, um, other um, units and just would never get released. So I don't have any of those stories, but just from the simple, the simple things of, you know, it's funny is I I was talking um, and telling this story probably four or five months ago, and it just dawned on me, everybody had a difficult time I say everybody, a lot of people had a difficult time in basic training in AIT, right? Uh, Drill sergeants yelling at you, all this stuff. For me, it felt normal. I I didn't get stressed out. I I mean, yeah, we lost some sleep. We slept outside. We did these things, like physical stuff, whatever. That was kind of fun, really. Um, Shooting guns, hanging out outside, like no big deal. But in regards to like the stresses that people get when they're in that, in that environment, I realized like, oh, that was just normal for me you know, whether it be sleep deprivation or hunger or somebody yelling at you, or you got to do this pressure. Um, and then it allowed me to slow down and realize like, 
you can still make progress under those circumstances. It's fine. But all the small little things that they teach you in, in the military um, just kind of were good. And I think the biggest thing is it, it removed external stimuli time period where I could really start thinking for myself. I, 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 because of the younger years, the, the drugs, the alcohol that were involved heavily in, into creating that kind of that environment, I had pushed it off until I was about 16. And then I got into just drinking and then a little bit of other things um, for a short period of time around like age 18, 19. And that allowed me to just remove everything and kind of be there and, and, and not be distracted by it. Don't get me wrong. I, you know, uh, we all have our shortcomings. And then I went back to certain things after, after that, but for the time being, right. Uh, and also connecting with other people, which I really, as much as an introvert, as I kind of think I am at times, uh, it was really cool meeting all these different people from, and not just the U S we met people from all over the world that were coming to training. Um, it was, it was just, it was cool. It was something that get me completely out of the, um, whether it's toxic or the bad environment or whatever it was that I had grown up in. Uh, and I didn't have to worry about the, the, the certain responsibilities, right? Like paying for an apartment or a house or food or anything like that. I just had to do the work. Perfect. So once uh, your military experience was over, um, what, what kind of transpired in terms of, uh, life happenings so i'm still spiral, spiraling out of control lost trying to find I'm trying to find myself i get out um i i wanted to i started to really enjoy the army um but i wanted to do i wanted to move past the the mos so i was a mechanic i wanted to move past that i wanted to be, get into special operations we had the special forces guy come talk to us i don't know if i ever would have passed I, we didn't go down that but i started getting some interest in it and uh, we had 160th uh, Special Forces there on, on Fort Campbell. It was really cool, high speed, uh, really looked up to them, all the things that they were doing. But I met a beautiful young gymnast from the University of Oklahoma, and puppy love set in. And, you know, it's completely different lifestyles, right, where I grew up, where she grew up, just completely different. And uh, I was just – fascinated by her like with the gymnastics like she was she was a, she was it is a, a just a great human being and I, the puppy love got me hard and then uh i no longer really kind of the army kind of thing got pushed to the side and i was uh, approaching the end of the four years and um so i didn't have any interest in re-enlisting i wanted to be closer to her because at this time we had been dating maybe it might've been two years at this point, And it was 10 hours. It was 680 miles. And often I would drive on the weekend, 10 hours, stopping one time at the same gas station that has a restroom outside of the gas station. And I would be done before the gas was done pumping. So, I mean, I had it mapped out. Uh, we live in Oklahoma now, but um, I would drive from Fort Campbell to here to come visit her and then turn around. I get here for, you know, Friday night, Saturday morning, turn around and drive back. Right. Um, so she became that, that thing that I was very, you know, that it for me. And so, um, I got out still, again, still lost, still trying to figure out what I want to do, where, where I want to go. Um, but I had the ability to go to the school in Texas, hundred percent tuition and fees paid for. I really wasn't interested in it. Never been interested in school. C's get degrees kind of thing. I mean, especially if you think back, like, School was the last of my worries, right? I was just worried about surviving, if you will, again. And so uh, basketball actually helped me with school because I had to pass in order to play. So that it never really was a thing for me. But my father-in-law was asking me what I was going to do. And of course, like your girlfriend's dad asking you what you're going to do, you got to get your shit together, right? And uh, he's been an uh, extremely positive influence. I, I, when I asked my, uh, you know, for their hand, or for their permission, or you do that whole kind of traditional thing. I said, if they told me no, that they would have to adopt me. So like, they didn't really have a choice to get rid of me, but he's been a, they both have, uh, my in-laws have been a extremely positive influence in my life. And so he, uh, he asked me what I was going to do. And I said, well, I could go to school and, uh, but I think I'm going to go to the oil field. And he's like, well, why don't you go to college? I said, well, I'm, I'm too dumb to go to college. And he wasn't having it. He wasn't very happy about that response. Right. 
self-defecating, if you will. And he goes, okay, well, I said, well we got paid for books. I don't, I don't even know how much those cost. He goes, if you go to school and you pass, I will pay for your books. And so I went to, I went as far north in Texas as I could go to be closer to Oklahoma uh, so that I could get the tuition and fees paid for. So that's when I attended the University of North Texas, um, about two hour drive uh, to, from, from my now wife. We've, we've been together now 15 years. Uh, somebody putting up me with me that long is a feather in her hat. That's that's cool, man. So, what did you uh, what did you end up studying um, in college then, Sean? Yeah, so I got a uh, health promotion, like a corporate based wellness. It was a health. It was, it was really big and growing at the time. Um, health promotion uh, degree. It's pretty much the same classes as like uh, uh, kinesiology, uh, health, uh, phys ed, stuff like that. I took a lot of the same anatomy one or two. It's just we moved towards the end of the schooling. We moved more to the corporate based kind of wellness and stuff like that, uh, which I never went and used and pursued. Uh, but I did get the I did get the four year degree, and I was the uh, I, I guess I still am the first uh, person in my, my not just my immediate family but my family to to have a four year college degree. Very cool. That's awesome, man. So um, let's, uh, let's talk about, um, when you really started to get into bodybuilding, because obviously you, um, you know, had some great experiences, uh, in bodybuilding. And I'm kind of curious, cause just kind of doing a little bit of reading up and preparation for our conversation, you won the 2016 overall at the NPC nationals, which that's a uh, no small feat. So why don't you talk about when you actually started training, like specifically for bodybuilding, like how did you kind of get into it? Did somebody introduce it to you? Did you just kind of pick up a magazine? Talk about that and then talk about the evolution of your first competition. How did that go? And then up to the point when you turn pro, please. Yeah. So, you know, in college, I had already been training, you know, I guess bodybuilding, what I thought it was at the time. Sure. Some workouts in the magazine and a diet in the magazine. Right. Um, in the army is when I started to kind of pick that up a little bit um, more. I even had, I need to find the picture. I had the, I don't even know what brand it is, but I, in my barracks room, we lived in the Air Force barracks, as they call them. They were really nice. They were brand new. And so we had separate rooms. We had a kitchen. In my room, you walked in and I had uh, the, the setup where the, you could do a bench press, incline, leg extensions, you know, the old school one. It was a decent one. And I even had dumbbells. I had some barbells. Now, I'm saying, I mean, Fort Campbell has phenomenal gyms. I was just, I don't know. I even have a home, I have a home gym, home garage gym set up now. I love, and that's where I exclusively train. So maybe it's that, or maybe it was my insecurities of wanting to go there, especially in the army is a bunch of big dudes training. Right. So that's where I started training. Uh, there was a guy, uh, Frederico Baker, Frederick Baker. He was uh, from Panama and he was huge. Nicest guy, nicest guy. And, um, he would always play up, play up. Where's your water at? He was like, he was just a big teddy bear, but he was gigantic. And he kind of, he'd bring me the magazines and we'd look at them and stuff like that. So that kind of really sparked the bodybuilding interest, right? I always liked the physiques in high school and stuff like that, but that was like, okay, well, who is that? What is this? Right. Oh, there's girls in there. This is crazy. And then I kept training, but I still, I'm still going back to a lot of those bad habits that I, that I learned from a younger years was drinking off and on, doing, you know, cutting up, things like that. Um, and my wife met a girl here in, in Oklahoma. Her name is Tracy, and she was in you know, fitness competitions. And my wife was a gymnast, so Tracy came and talked to the gymnast. So they started talking and hanging out. They became kind of friends outside of, outside of that. Well, Tracy was friends with, uh, do you know the name Sean Andros? Uh, not familiar with that, no. He, uh, he used to work for Species. Um, he, does, he, does, he helps, uh, or at least from my understanding, uh, Mr. Weinberger up in New York. Um, Sean's a bit of a, can kind of do ev ev everything. Um, very influential for bodybuilding for me, and we'll get into that, I'm sure. But she was friends with him. Well, she invited us to come to a show, the Red River Classic in Oklahoma. We came up here and I was like, whoa, like seeing it in person was something else, right? Especially seeing some people that weren't the giants. And I'm like, oh, well, there's levels to this. 
And I said, well, I want to do a show. You know, I've been training still at the rec and working out. And I was getting ready to get into my, uh, I finished school in three years. So I was getting into my third year of school. And uh, I said, I want to, I want to do a show. I just don't know where to start. And Tracy's like, well, I'll, I'll ask Sean to see if he'll help you. And sure enough, like he did, it's not something he did regularly, but just as a friend thing, he, he said he would help me. Um, and I was like, all right, well, you know, let's do this. And so I remember like when I first started, I would go to the gym to train and I, the phenomenal basketball court at UNT's Brick Center, and I'd play ball. I'd go to, I'd maybe warm up, and I'd be three hours, you know, into my warm up, just hooping. Loved it, right? I mean, just that was my thing. And finally, I just remember putting the ball down. I was like, I can't do it anymore. I have to step away because just it was too much. Even then, I knew that it was too much cardio, and even I didn't know what the hell cardio was. So uh, I get with Sean, and we start a prep, a sixteen week prep, and. Um, I'm going to school 18 hours. I'm working part time. I'm I, I worked at the house that I lived in to pay for rent as well. Um, and then I prepped for the, the bodybuilding show all while doing that. It's 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 interesting. Is almost every prep I feel like I've I've always stacked the external things to to do, uh, and I get more efficient at them. But um, so yeah, I prepped for the Red River. Um, Two weeks out, three weeks out, I came to pose with uh, the head judge here, uh, who became a friend, Tommy Brown. And uh, one thing Sean told me is like, don't let anybody like get into your head about your diet. Because at that point, we had started with carbs. I think we kind of got into the kind of bro keto kind of thing. But we did start with carbs and then got. And so I was severely flat, couldn't hold anything. But I was in shape for three weeks out for my first show. And uh, he said, this is a bodybuilding contest, not a body shrinking contest. And up until that point, I had been laser focused. I didn't cheat. Well, I had a cheat meal that night and I took that cheat meal excessively, way too excessively. I was eating, I put like the cocoa almonds in like milk and I was eating them like cereal. It was wild from Costco, like the big one. So the reason I say that is because at that point I was 175 pounds, cutoff was 178. But I never saw 178 again. Uh, so I had to compete as a, a light heavy in the in the open, and uh, I got second. But I won middleweight uh, novice, and I won middleweight overall. Um, and yeah, I lost. I, I was very upset that I lost. And I should have I should have been a middleweight in the open, which I um, would have won that class. Um, ended up beating that guy that won that class. But anyways, so that was my first show, and. I was, uh, Sean, Sean was tremendous because I, I, I wrote one thing down. He told me I was about, I was about three weeks out, probably around the same time that, um, I went down here, came up here to, uh, to pose and I emailed him. I'm like, Hey, Sean, I'm not complaining. I'm not bitching, but like, is it supposed to hurt this bad? If it is like, that's fine. I just don't have a, I don't have a reference and like my feet are burning I can't sleep. I'm just, I'm in agony. Right. And I'm like, if, if this is normal, that's fine. I just want to know. And he goes, he, all his response was, it hurts because you're going to a place that no one else will go. And so I like copy and pasted that. And that was like my background and, you know, it worked. And I used that, you know, for the next six years as I competed, but um, yeah, I, it, you know, for, for my first show came out of there, um, did, did very well. And um, at a time when I think bodybuilding was still, you know, very, very competitive because we didn't have the other, everybody gravitated toward bodybuilding because that's all we had. Um, so from there I competed, I don't know, I won't go into each show, you know, as depth as that, but I did the um, muscle mayhem. I uh, won my weight class and then I went against Matt Berzicott in the overall. And I thought, I was like, what the hell is this guy even doing here? Cause I'm still, I'm still small fry. Right. Uh, but I was insane. I died in 22 weeks for that one. Um, and then I came back to Oklahoma. We were living here. I did the um, OKC Grand Prix. I think the Red River may have turned into that. I won, uh, worked with Shelby Starnes for that one. I uh, won my weight class, the overall and the most muscular. Uh, and that was a real eye-opening experience for me. Like, oh, wow. Like, even uh, the, just the first time I really had decent stage shots as well. Prior to that, I don't think I ever had any. And so seeing myself, I was like, oh, shit, like, you don't look like a shiny turd, <laughs> you know, you're yeah, all right. And so I got a little confidence there. Um, 
from there, I did, uh, I kind of bypassed um, what everybody says not to do, I did. And I went and did um, USA's in 2014, I think. And um, I ended up getting fourth. Uh, there's a Louisiana guy won, like Caleb or Cat, I forget his name. But that was, I was still a, a light heavyweight at that time. And then I came back the next year and I did it again. I had some issues with fluid, which I come to find out that was a big thing for me with like humidity and this, that, and the other. Um, before even doing, I, I landed early and I lost 10 pounds. I was eating more food and the water just came off of me, regardless of what I did. And so I ended up dropping to 10. Still, I mean, there was like 48 guys in the class. So it's, it's still, you know, not horrible. Um, after that, I went and did Texas State to requalify. I won Texas State, um, which Mr. Texas, for me, that was cool being born and raised in Texas. Ended up um, doing that show. And then the following year, um, I was like, well, we're going to do nationals, right? This time I, I was working with Nutrex Research at the time. I was originally Gaspari. Then I went to, New I was actually a sales rep for Nutrex, the uh, Southwest Territory Manager. So I'm working with them. Um, I, I got on board with GASP as well. I was living in Dallas at this time. Um, and so it was a kind of a, I was in that, in that circle, if you will. And um, I was like, well, just in case I you know, fall on my ass again, I'm going to requalify because there are no shows after nationals. So I'm working with um, <clears throat> a buddy of mine at the time. We kind of parted ways and I'm happy to say that we're, we're back talking and communicating and we're pretty friendly now, Tony Friedrich who, um, again, was very, very beneficial um, for my competing times. Um, and we were getting ready for Texas State. I was the best I had looked, um, feeling good, this, that, and the other. I, you know, in my opinion, we had some issues with uh, getting some water off diuretics. Didn't, uh, didn't go as planned uh, for the warm-up show, if you will. Um, not taking anything away from Mr. Patrick Moore, who wiped, you know, the, the stage with everybody. Um, obviously we know he's grown into a tremendous bodybuilder now, but, um, so that was an interesting time. I had been more outspoken about the shows I was going to do because I was sponsored by gas and working with Nutrex. I kind of had to, because they were utilizing some of it as well. Uh, whereas in the past, I really kept hush hush until the, the week of the show, really, if that just sometimes just showed up it was not very uh, normal for me to be outspoken. And then I fall straight on my on my face. Right. So what am I going to do? Um, I called a friend. And I talked to her who happens to be Gina Davis. She's a pro. Uh, she coaches Steve McClure right now. She's a, uh, a prep coach. And she she had become just a, a friend at the time, not as close as we are now. She's a really kind of close family friend now. And I was upset. I wasn't upset with, with Tony. I wasn't upset with myself, really. I was just upset because, like, I did not translate to what I knew I had looked like to what was on stage, whether that be of the diuretics, my fault, whatever it was. I, wasn't, I, didn't, I wasn't playing a blame game. It was just frustrating, right? Because you compete, so you get it, and all the other competitors will get it. You work so much and so hard towards that. And it just fall on your face. It's like, what the hell did I do wrong, right? And I had success in the past of not falling on my face. So I was lost. Two weeks out from nationals, I didn't know what I was going to do. I was like, I'm not, I'm not going. Now, mind you, she had a competitor in the show. And she just, um, just kind of like put her foot in my ass. And, was, and you know, she, now I have to say this, she did not help me. She did not prep me. She, had, she doesn't do that last minute kind of thing. But I looked to her for advice, right? Because she was a friend. And I remember I ate like an asshole that weekend. And my wife and I were just at dinner. And I told her, I'm not going to nationals. I had paid for the trip. It's done. I was like, hey, we'll go to Miami. We'll, we'll support her and our athlete and some friends there. But I'll just till next year. But there was still something missing, right? So I talked to her and I'm getting emotional. I'm frustrated. I'm like, what the hell am I going to do? And I look at my wife and I was like, all right, like, so Gina is trying to talk me into like, like you can do it yourself. So I'm sitting in the driveway of the parking lot. I can remember clear as day. I'm trying to figure out. And I look at my wife and I'm like, all right, like 
I'll do that. I'm gonna, I was like, I'm going to need your help. I just need you to, like, it's going to suck because I'm going to have to go no carb, this, that, and the other, the small you know, semantics about it. And so I said, okay, because uh, at this point, I'm bloated and mess. I ate like shit sat- Saturday night and pretty much Sunday as well. I was like, all right. And I had an event in Houston the following Saturday that I had to work for Nutrix. And I said, all right. And I told my wife, I said, I'm going to need you to be there for me. Help me here. Help me there. I got a lot going on. Uh, if you're in, I'm in. We'll see what we we'll see what we look like on Wednesday. So I dropped the carbs and I dropped the hammer. And she's doing cardio with me twice a day. She's training with me. And you know how it is, like right, grumpy, blah, 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 whatever. And I wake up Wednesday and I'm like, holy shit. Like I okay. Like almost look better, if you will, right? And I started getting a little bit, I'm like, all right, I'm not canceling anything. It's already paid for, anyways. I was going, but we're going and we're gonna compete now. Still didn't told anybody. Uh, that you know that what I was gonna do. We go on uh, Saturday. We go to Houston. She drives the whole way. We work the event, stay the night. She drives back, we train there. She's she's rock solid, right? Which is I have to. It's very noteworthy. She understands the mindset, right? You don't just get to be an OU gymnast and in the starting lineup and starting some of the events like Bean without having a lifelong experience in that she started when she was five she's an athlete of mindset she gets it right so we uh we come back and it's it's on right like i'm i'm ready to go we come back saturday my metabolism was through the roof i started feeding myself saturday which is probably a huge mistake and um we fly out i think tuesday and at this point i started taking a note i had a notebook somewhere at the house we start taking a notes of everything i'm talking like because at this point, I'm like, what the hell did I do wrong? Was it sodium that I messed up for the first show? What did I do, right? Uh, and I, back to that show, I was also upset at myself because I never showcased, uh, I, I was like a poor sport on stage as well. And it wasn't at them. I wasn't mad. I was mad at myself. I couldn't, I just couldn't feel my physique. And you could see it on my face. And so I was also frustrated at myself because of that, because I kind of showed myself in a poor light, poor lighting. And it had nothing to do with anything, anybody else besides me. Um, so I'm writing everything down when I'm using the restroom, uh, my weight, what I'm eating, my sodium, how much I'm taking, literally everything. So we get to, um, we get to, to nationals and, and to be quite honest, like I never had a plan to win. You know, I never had it in my head. I could win nationals one day. That's not my thing. I just never, I just, I wanted to compete and be my best. I, I never saw myself in light, uh, a light that like, Oh, I'm better than that guy, better than that guy. Um, so we get there and it's really just redemption for me. I just, I don't care what I place. I literally, I told my wife, I don't care. I just want to look better. So we get there and, you know, um, everybody's staying at the host hotel. I find an Airbnb that's literally a garage turned into a, a living unit on the side of a random house, maybe seven, eight minute drive. And I told my wife, I was like, I just got to be away from everything. So we go there a little early, get my hair cut like I like to do. We do this, we do that. We're hanging out, not doing too much. And uh, yeah, like turn on the lights. And um, I, I mean, I don't know where to go from there. Like we're in the first call out and I'm completely like, what the fuck is going on? Like, you know, I mean, I can, I can elaborate into that night as well uh, if you want to. But I, I mean, I did everything myself. The big thing I did not do is the only show that I've never taken a diuretic for. Hmm. It's the only show I've never taken a diuretic for. Um, you know, we did some water manipulation. I tried to do things here and there. I drank a little bit of wine the night before. I don't know if that helped or not. Um, I did ha- I did use uh, Project AD's H2O Remove, I think it's called. Um, I used quite a few of their products, That like seven of their products, like the pump stuff, this, that, and the other. Um, that week, uh, even that prep, I was using their products as I was working for another company. Uh, so I, I believed in them you know, pretty well. But um, yeah, I, I couldn't believe I was in first call out. I didn't think I was, then they were telling me I was like top two, you know, I couldn't believe that. Um, and so, yeah, man, I uh, came back and it, it it's weird. Everything that evening when I, you know, we came back was just, by the numbers from getting to the Airbnb back. So for example, we went to the athlete meeting, right? And everybody typically stays there or goes to their hotel room. I went back to my Airbnb. I didn't want anything to do with the venue. I had people texting me. I was watching some of the live stream. It wasn't a live stream, but like live feeds. 
And I told my wife, she, she's a stressor. I said, don't stress. I said, I will call. I had the Uber, like, you know, you can, uh, right before you push approve, it tells you how long. I'm like, all right, I'm timing it out perfectly. I'm like, don't stress. I don't want to be there too early. I just need you to forget about it. If I don't show up on time, it's on me. That's it. So she's not, she's saying she's not stressing. So we get there to the venue as bodybuilder is going on and people are pumping up. I go downstage, have a small meal. I'm maybe there 15 minutes before they're like, all right, it's time to, time to pump up. We go up there, I do my little thing, start pumping up and the rest is history. All I remember is saying, oh shit, probably 30 times as they were handing me the trophy because I could not believe what just had happened. Right. Now, uh, just, I'm curious, uh, were you uh, a heavyweight? Were you a super heavyweight uh, when you won the overall? I was 217 pounds. I was a heavyweight. And one thing I, and I have to credit Tony for this, uh, cause we had worked together a pretty, a pretty long time, longer than anybody, you know, he had told me, Hey, let's take a break prior a long, a pretty good break. Right. Got off of everything and, um, just let the body, uh, resensitize or whatever bodybuilders say. Um, but my starting weight for the prep was 218 pounds. And my, I was on stage at 218 pounds. So I was a heavyweight. Yep. Very cool. So talk to me a little bit because uh, this past nationals, I um, had uh, quite a few of the guys that turned pro at the, the, the nationals uh, just uh, this last year on the podcast. And, you know, it's, it's always cool to kind of talk to them, um, especially that uh, post show. Um, and it's so uh, recent in their memory just to kind of get the feelings and the emotions. So for you, Sean, not really having the mindset like, hey, I'm better than this guy or better than that guy. I'm not really trying to win the overall. You're just trying to be the best version of yourself, you said earlier. But when you when 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 it happened, you got the trophy, um, when you kind of maybe had a, a day or two to think about it, like what were some of those feelings and those emotions that you had and you experienced? And then talk to us about what was your mindset going forward now as a new IFBB pro. Also, how did you kind of handle some of the accolades and, you know, some of the interviews and everything that comes with being, um, you know, a new IFBB pro, but also an overall at a national competition? Sure. I think the biggest thing for me that hit almost immediately, my wife and I, we, there wasn't a big entourage. There wasn't, uh, it was, it was just me and her. We went to, whatever popular diner is down there, pink diner or something, whatever one it is in Miami. Uh, and I didn't even go back. I, I didn't want to, I didn't want the restaurants to close. Cause that's happened to me literally almost every time I've competed. So we went there with like the big trophies in an Airbnb or in an Uber. Right. And uh, so it was interesting, but it hit me, you know, probably right away that it, it's kind of like an investment, right? You, you can, you can invest money and, you can, and you can lose, you can fall on your face. Um, this is obviously more than just an investment of money, although people obviously work for money. Um, but I was, you know, I was that, you know, meatheads, meathead, if you will, right? Like I, eating at a Tupperware in the car as everybody's inside. Um, we, my wife wanted to go somewhere. The first thing I would look is like, what gym is in the area, right? Like, packing all my I was that I was the quintessential like I was that was me that was my life so I knew no other way for that that time all the sacrifices that I put into uh, and not only in, in and I say I and what I really started to hit me was all the I, I I didn't really have the family component growing up at this time as 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 still lost as I am as I was personally and all these different things I had a family right I had my in-laws I had my wife uh, and we had a, a few close friends and when you when 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 you have those things, they also sacrifice as well, right? Uh, I get people say it's an individual thing. Sure, okay, I get it. But if you're trying to have you know those those other aspects of your life, like they 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 sacrifice as well, as well also because they want you to be part of those certain things or places you're going, and it's just a part of trying to excel at anything. It's not just bodybuilding. There are going to be sacrifices to be made, uh, and I recognize the fact that those people who are didn't grow up as my family who now accepted me as their family were making sacrifices for me as well and so it, it what really hit me it was like wow like the, it paid off for them even though like 
they didn't get anything out of it, but they to see my success fulfilled them. Uh, my first interview was with India, India Paulino and, and my wife's there and she's a mess, right? She's just coming out and, and I'm talking mainly about her and her support. And so, and you know, I've never had that. I never had support growing up outside of a few influential individuals like my coach, for example. Um, and, and so it was very, it was very important to me. And it, the biggest thing was like, wow, like these people sacrificed and I was able to accomplish that. Um, so that was the biggest thing that really hit home for me, like, oh shit. And, 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 and that doesn't mean that like somebody who doesn't win, like should not feel that as well. But for me, that's what I took away from that. Despite having had won before, it's a big show, right? Um, especially with coming in rock bottom, right? I got third two weeks prior to that. I, most people don't know this. I got third at Texas State. And then to winning, it was unbelievable. Um, yeah, handling the, the, the interviews, um, kind of like I am now, just, just talk. That never really was uh, too, too much of something I was keen on. And so I just kind of talk like I am now and hopefully I'm not sound like a, like a fucking idiot. Uh, but prior to this, and then even afterward, I, I spent a lot of time with uh, the videographer from gas, better bodies He's become a dear friend of ours, uh, Nick Del Toro. And um, as great as he is behind the camera, he's very good, like curating and talking to you and trying to get those things out. So I, I had a little bit of experience now that I was working with gas doing those things because of him and how good he is behind the camera. Um, so yeah, I, um, I think that was the question. I know there's one more I'm missing there. No, no, that's, that's you, you kind of answer it. Just, uh, <clears throat> what, what was your mindset, Sean, then, you know, as a newly crowned IFBB pro, what was your mindset going forward? Because, you know, you've kind of already said like you, you, you never were the guy that's like, didn't sound like you had the mindset, like I wanted to be Mr. Olympia someday. You were just, again, trying to be the best version of yourself. So once you did get that pro card, what was that mindset going forward? And then um, what did you decide to do for your uh, pro debut? Sure. So at that point, 218, right? And right there, 212s. And I'd personally been a fan of the 212 guys. Um, I, and, and, and because one thing I severely lacked and I'm working on to this day is self-confidence, right? And so for me, it was a self-confidence thing. A 212, that's, that's, that's it's a little bit more, it's a little easier, right? I, I say easier, but got to go up with the big boys. All these guys that literally have been in the magazines or like if I go back, for example, uh, before I competed, we, I was in North Texas and my wife would come and visit sometimes and we were kind of getting a little more familiar with, you know, competing and stuff, which she has competed uh, twice now in fitness. Um, actually, I started prep before she did. She competed before I did uh, at the Dallas Europa. but. In that environment, we had started going to uh, Metroflex North Texas, which is now known as Destination, before the first Destination location with a very good friend, Greg McCoy. And so all the guys that I would have had to have been competing now, I saw many of them at the uh, Metroflex North Texas. And I was like, so I'm still of the mindset that I'm, I'm that little, you know, pipsqueak, you know, middleweight bodybuilder. There's no way I can compete against these guys, right? They're just genetic anomalies. And so at this point, um, I had, I, so I did the prep myself or sorry, sorry, no, 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 Tony. And I have to attribute a lot of that success because how much really can you do in that two weeks? Obviously you can do enough to screw up the peak, if you will, at Texas state, but you're not going to do so much that like you, you, you take away from somebody helping you for 16 weeks or whatever it was. So Tony helped me tremendously for that, that the first major part of that prep. And then I peaked myself, but afterward I was like, what am I going to do? And so obviously Gina Davis came, came to mind. Um, and so I decided to work with her and she's a, she's a different breed. Right. Um, so I never worked with anybody in person as far as training, but she wanted that aspect and she never worked with anybody remotely. So she wanted that. So we kind of married that. I wasn't here all the time, but because my job traveled, I could make my way up here. Um, cause at the time we were living in Dallas. And so, um, I was like, all right, I want to, I want to do a, a, a pro show. Um, I didn't really have anything in mind, like weight wise, timing wise, but I was like, I got to do two twelve. 
And she's fighting me. She's like, no, your body wants to grow. She's in a, you know, to, uh, to my detriment, I'm fighting her like, no, 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 no. So we, we decide on the Dallas, the Dallas pro cause it's in Texas. Um, and my sister wanted to go. Um, my dad had showed interest after all the years in, in possibly going, uh, which is a whole kind of another, uh, you know, book of itself, but, uh, or box of worms, as they say, but uh, can of worms. So <clears throat> we start prepping for that and prep is going tremendous. Great. Up until about, and I, it's not going bad. When I say up until it's because of my decision to do 212, we're getting to about three or four weeks out. I'm looking good. I'm heavy. I'm about 224, 225, right to where like Gina really gets like, that's where she shines like the last like month. She's great all around, but preserving muscle and getting you lean and feeding you and all the good stuff. Right. But my self-confident lacking ass was like, nah, I wanted to do 212. I wanted to do 212. And at this point, I'm like, how am I going to get down there? Right. So we, we get down there, but to my physique's detriment, you know, I'm not a bubbly guy. I'm not um, a guy that just like looks great just cause like I have to really be primed and I didn't allow her to prime me, if you will. And uh, I looked really, really good, but not to where she had me about a month out. I was, uh, I got some photos and I'm like, at the time I'm like, in my head, it was like, oh, he's still got this, 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 but man, looking back, like that's the best I've ever looked. Um, but what I should have done is I should have stepped back and I should have done um, the Chicago pro like two weeks later. Uh, that was the next open show. Um, at that point though, I was just, with bodybuilding, I mentally just, just the prepping, because I prep, you know, like a lot of guys, just prepped hard, man. And the toll it was taking on me physically, my relationships, uh, work, just, it was so, so much, right? I'm not, I'm preaching to the choir, right? It's so much for everybody. But for me, it was just, it was, it was getting a bit, a bit much. Um, and so I was ready for the, the things to you know, be done and move on. And um, I'm also weird when I get uh, like the blinds can be messed up right now and it drives me crazy because they need to be perfect. I'm not OCD, but there's some things where I get a perfection or I get an idea, idea in my head. Like it has to be there. And so I, I had had to, and it's not, it doesn't help when I have the lack of self-confidence to go and compete against the big boys as well. So yeah, we ended up doing that show. I think I got, it was, there was like 25 competitors. I got 16th, right? So DNP, uh, Sean Clarita had, had won that show. Um, I was pretty happy with uh, how I looked for the pro debut. It was a hell of an experience to, to be up there. I'd never in a million years imagined I'd be on a pro stage. Um, so that was cool. I did one show and um, I retired. My, my wife was six months pregnant at the time, I believe. Um, and I didn't officially like retire. I didn't officially say that was my retirement. Um, I had some some digestive issues, some health issues, just with digestion. After that, which spiraled out of control, figuring things out. I had my daughter. I thought maybe I could, you know, compete down the road. And then one thing after another, I launched Pride, and uh, my life just transitioned. Um, the desire transitioned, and and uh, I, yeah, I stepped away from from bodybuilding. So I we're, we're I want to get into Pride because that that I mean I've got a couple. Uh bags right here just because i i definitely support pride and and yeah um, have uh have have it every single day in terms of my uh, eating regimen but before we do um i i just i want to i want to i want to pull this out of you or i want to draw this out of you sean because i i feel like this is this is going to be something that's going to be very impactful for everybody that's listening whether they are a competitive bodybuilder or they're just interested in bodybuilding or they're just interested in you or they're interested in, in this specific podcast, what have you. But, um, so, you know, you, you, first of all, I want to ask you this, did bodybuilding help you, uh, in terms of your identity as an individual, do you feel like it gave you that confidence? It gave you an identity. It kind of gave you a direction for your life. That's the first question that I, I got something to follow up with that. It's weird. I have been introduced by my, my friends, my wife, uh, peers, as a bodybuilder or as a pro or as Mr. Texas, more so than I've ever, I, I've ever said it myself. Um, I, I've 
I've just never, I don't know. I never identified as a bodybuilder. Um, I, yeah, I, I, but I think it, it did help me in regards to identity because it did, it, it, it has helped me tremendously with self-confidence, right? Because you have this work that needs to be done, right? You have this blob of mess that you want to turn into your, your, your art, your statue. By all the work that you put into it, you can, you can get this end result. And fortunately for me, that end result did end in, you know, winning, um, you know, quite a bit. I, I, I did decently well um, on, on stage. And so I think the big thing in regards to identity is it, it really nailed down, like, if you are willing to work for it, right, you can have the outcome that you want to have, whatever that is. And obviously, bodybuilding is very difficult mentally and physically. Um, but in regards to like IFBB pro Sean, this, I, I, no, I don't, you know, it never, I, that's not my identity, but the work your ass off, you know, um, accountability, it did help nail that home and, and, and bring that, you know, up for me. Cause it's something that I've, I've lacked tremendously my entire life. Perfect. So then the, 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 the follow-up that I have to ask, cause I was reading a post that you had, uh, put on your Instagram in 2019 when you you know, I think like in your heart, you're like, man, like I'm, I'm, I'm done with this bodybuilding thing. Um, you, your, uh, uh, your child had just been born and you made this post. You just said like, right away, you're like human post is I think actually what you put. And then you had a long kind of like just uh, explanation of what you were going through. You, your, your training. I don't think you'd really been training in terms of lifting at that point. And you were just kind of struggling with, I think, letting go of maybe not the identity of being a bodybuilder, but just the aspect of training really helped you as an overall human being be better. That's kind of what the gist I took away from that post. So this is the aspect that I just want to draw out from you and just to have you share before we kind of finish up with the pride talk. Um, Can you speak to maybe some of those people that, uh, you know, maybe bodybuilding or, or just lifting weights is kind of their identity, or at least it's a big part of their lives, but maybe they, are going through a transition. Maybe they just got married. Maybe they just got a new job. Maybe they just had a kid kind of like you did at that point. And, and can you speak to them about letting go or transitioning? Maybe that's a better word from sure. who they used to be in terms of this being a big part of their lives to who they need to be presently. Yeah, that's a, it's a great question. It's a bit deep, right? Like, because for me, it wasn't a page. It was more of a, of a chapter, right? The transition alone was a chapter right? All these different chapters is a transition alone because you hear I had something that was directly, my, my success was a directly attributed to the work. And so, and then I got a, I was, you know, I was actually on the sponsored athletes page is with Kaspari. Um, I was working for them and I was like, my picture was next to Branch Warren. That was it, right? I did three shows and I was like, I was on cloud nine, right? And so <clears throat> I was like, wow, that's cool. And then I got the job offer i had interviewed for quest gaspari and nutrex for the uh, territory manager ended up going with nutrex and so i'm now working in the industry I'm going to the arnold's i went to the arnold for gas i'm working with them i go to the olympias i'm like oh my gosh right which came from bodybuilding and so um it was hard to let it go because everything that i kind of the position i was in the places I've been were, were tied to that. And I was very good at putting the work in and, and reaping the benefits. And, and that transition took some time. And I mean, up until maybe even as little as six months to eight months ago, like I just every now and again, I'm like, well, I, you know, I mean, 210 pounds, I can do classic, right? Um, I've oftentimes said that if I had not, if I weren't a pro, I may down the road compete as an amateur again right but i'm i would never you know relinquish that 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 title it's it's an honor to have it right and so that was just my mind saying oh maybe you compete again but you know one thing that parents told me whenever and i didn't understand it fully so what they would tell me is like oh you're not going to you're not going to compete when you have a kid you're not going to want to do this not going to want to and i would be stopped I can do whatever I want to do, right? If I I can put the work in, I can do it. But what they failed to mention is that that does your desire, your priorities change, right? Like I, I, one day I was in the gym, 
I was in uh, 24 hour fitness down the road. I'd been with my daughter pretty much all day. I think she was sick. Kids get sick. And I go to the gym, I'm warming up and just, it wasn't feeling good. And I got it. I got like one exercise done. Excuse me. My wife had texted me. I remember clear as day, something about my daughter, you know, she's not feeling good, whatever. Again, I was with her all day and just texted me. And like, I was like, man, I, in my head, I told myself, I was like, my heart's not here. It's at home. Every time that I went to the gym prior to that, regardless of what was going on, I could just like, um, uh, for the love of the game, uh, um, what's his name? Kevin Costner. I, I, I know the movie, but I don't, I don't know the specific names. Yeah. So like Kevin Costner was like, cure the mechanism and just like zone in. Like I get to the gym and it was on the way there with the, with the uh, MP3 files or music, or whatever it was, I'd get zoned in, sit in the parking lot, pre-workouts, whatever. And I could just be there. And I was the guy that got, like, you know, I mean, I'd train way too long, probably sometimes two hours, two and a half hours, whatever. But that was my time. I couldn't do that. I couldn't do it anymore. I even had a whole gym, you know, train when we good, right? Trying to juggle the whole situation, my wife. And, and we didn't, we don't have family around. It's just us I'm just trying to maintain this. And I was sitting there and I, I left and, and not even in the middle the beginning of the workout. I just, I went home. My wife's like, what are you doing? I was like, I, I said, I'm not, my heart's not there. My head's not there. I'm not supposed to be there. Like if I'm not going to do it a hundred percent, I'm not going to do it. I just, and so that's when I realized like, oh boy, that's what they're talking about. They're, ta they're not talking about you can't physically do it. They're just talking about like that, you know, and especially me. Again, everything goes back to the childhood. If you look back to how I grew up, now, one thing I will say about my dad, we, we didn't have much. He didn't have a bank account. The money he had was the money was in his wallet and never really was much, right? But he worked for it. He worked his ass off, right? Hurt people, hurt people. Or hurting people, hurt people. And so it's all cycles. And so unfortunately, he never had the opportunity to unpack those bags of the cycles that he had passed. And so he passed them on. But he also passed on that work, right? And so, but that work, what that mean? That meant he was gone all the time. And so for me, it's a big deal. Like I'm there, I physically, right? And then once you're there, be there, right? Uh, hang up and hang out, as they say, right? Take, take the phone, this, that, and the other. And I struggle with that now being a business owner. But that, I was like, man, I need to, I need to be there, right? And so <clears throat> that's, that was the seed that was like, man, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this again. So it prolonged on and on. Um, we ended up moving back. And we'll, we'll get into pride, but we launched pride the same week that we moved back. Um, and again, throughout the, the process of transitioning, I, I, I could not figure out how can I do this properly? How can I transition away from the bodybuilding? Um, it, I, at the time, maybe I, I did think it was some type of an identity. I'm not sure. It was still, I'm still lost, right? I'm still that lost three, four, five, six year old trying to figure things out. Um, what I come to realize is that it wasn't bodybuilding. It was the physicality and the mental um, struggle that drew me to it, right? Um, like I said, that when I was in basic, I realized like, oh, this is, this is normal. This is normal. When I was in bodybuilding, I didn't realize it then, but I realized it here in the past year, the, the, the misery and the suffering of bodybuilding, I, I rather enjoyed it, right? I remember telling people like, I, I, I'm not better than that guy, but I'll, I'll suffer him as, that, as if that's some like accolade. That's stupid. But for me, that was home. That was normal. So um, I started to realize that I just needed the, the training aspect, if you will, and, and the mental getting through some things mentally, which leads me into where I am now. So now uh, you know, I'm trying to downsize. My heaviest was around 270. Um, at the lowest I've been 198. I'm you know 205 ish now but um i have a road bike uh i've got a a, a runner curve runner as long as, as well as a treadmill um yesterday i was in the pool you know for a mile so the, the the transition i'm getting into now is i want to do endurance sports um so growing up i was an athlete bodybuilding is kind of a you know you're just a one-dimensional you know uh you move on certain planes and that's it i have been fortunate knock on wood that I haven't had any significant injuries and the body feels great. I actually feel tremendously better than I did when I was bodybuilding. 
Um, so uh, when I was in the army, we would run and run and run. I, I actually rather enjoy running, um, the biking and the swimming. I got to get used to, but I want to do uh, endurance triathlons. And I, uh, I have on the board, uh, to do an Ironman one day, which very cool. Like I said about bodybuilding, I don't, I didn't really say anything much. I just did it. And I'm fighting with uh, the, the, the idea of saying that out loud because I like to be my little hermit crab and do it. Uh, but for the business, it would be beneficial and on all those different aspects. But um, yeah, that's the plan is uh, so that transition to close that chapter is um, it, I mean, I thought you couldn't get much more difficult than a bodybuilding show. Right. But Iron Man mentally and physically is you know, swimming two miles in the open water is uh, it's going to be interesting. It's, it's, I'm, I'm very I'm not very buoyant still. So, um, but I'm getting I'm getting those um, I'm, I'm I'm feeding those dark demons with uh, some some mental struggle of the of training like that. Um, so it's interesting. It's fun. I enjoy it, and I still do weight training. I'm four days a week. I'm still training. I've got a full gym at the house that. I do everything there to, to kind of maximize my time, be more efficient. Very cool. I, I appreciate you uh, touch on that, Sean, because I know um, that that's definitely going to help some people. So let's, let's, uh, I mean, we could, we could go on for probably another two or three hours here because there's, there's a lot uh, that you've experienced in life, but let's kind of wrap things up. Let's <clears throat> close out by talking about uh, pride foods. Cause again, um, I'm a huge supporter. Um, I see it all over social media. So um, just a few things that I kind of want to draw out of, um, you know, you in terms of pride foods. First of all, talk about just like we kind of talked about your evolution as a human being up to this point. Um, just talk about give us maybe a little bit of the snapshot of the beginnings of pride foods. Like, why did you and your wife start it? And uh, just talk about that evolution up to kind of this point. I know there's there's a lot into it. Um, but just again, kind of that, that snapshot, if, if you don't mind, Sean. Sure. Sure. I introduced to it probably like 99% of people, um, by the late great John Meadows, um, when I worked with him in 2014 and, uh, his famous concoction bowl. Um, I was venturing into a business, um, of dog supplements that I wanted to do. I got talked into a partnership with some people that ended up not really working out but it taught me some extremely valuable lessons. And one of the things I learned along the way um, was manufacturing. So here I come from the small town farming community, graduated with 42 people, um, you know, not the best upbringing. So I just, I'm here. I don't, I don't really know much about these different things, manufacturing and stuff. So I learned the manufacturing process and I, I was like, oh, well, it's not that difficult, right? Um, and... I had my digestive issues prior to I talked to you about after my pro debut, which I had to kind of self, uh, I don't even know what the word I'm looking for is. I had to figure it out myself. I went to all these specialists, couldn't get anything going. So I, 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 read, I read some books, um, self-educated as much as I could at the time and ended up fixing my problem. But I learned about the quality of food, how important it is, um, quality of sourcing the soil, all these things, you know. And so pride actually stands for personal responsibility in delivering excellence, right? So in regards to the cream of rice, three years ago, we were the first and only organic. And now we're still the only organic. We're the top shelf premium, you know, the best of best ingredients, right? Uh, and here in the U.S., made in America as well, grown in, grown in the U.S. So we're very, very proud of that and, and, and like to stand by that. Uh, grown in Texas, if you will. But um, so I learned that process. Lo and behold, I knew a little bit of something about farming because I told you my dad uh, was a truck driver. And so in harvest time, he hauled rice or whatever was in harvest. And so um, I sourced out my, my rice manufacturer. So other companies may go to you know, a wholesaler and just buy whatever rice they have. It may come from Thailand, may come from China, may come from wherever, right? My rice is grown in Southeast Texas, organic, USDA certified. Very, very important for, you know, for that because the fumigation processes and all they have are the practices they have. And so uh, I, I sourced the rice. They make it to spec for me. We went back and forth uh, to get the specific size that I wanted because, as you know, when you eat it, it has a good texture to it, right? Um, if you get a powder, it's a completely different thing. Um, so I learned that manufacturing process. I got the rice, took it to the manufacturer, and I said, hey, can we flavor this? 
And literally the brown sugar cinnamon that uh, I'm sure, I hope at least you've tried because they're one of our top sellers. Uh, we, we, we flavored it. He flavored it and we tried it. And I was like, what is unbelievable. It was so good, especially compared to everything else. Now, the reason I wanted to do this is because on social media, you started to see everybody coming up with their own different ways to make this. And I'm, I'm thinking like, well, I can do this much easier for you, more convenient, right? So I can, I can get rid of all the, the you have a, a box that you can't reseal. There's no scoop inside. It's not organic. It's low quality. It has a ton of iron. Get rid of all that. And I can flavor it. So we did that and it was, it was a green light. I was like, holy crap. Uh, so we put an order in. And because I had a, a, a relationship with the manufacturer, he allowed me to go in on a very small run. We did 500 units on five SKUs, um, which is it's nothing, right? It's like five pallets. Um, and so I got the product. I got, a, uh, got it the same week of the Arnold in 2019. And I put it in a rolling suitcase. Um, I took off to the Arnold. And of course, I worked with Nutrex Gaspari, worked all these events, competing as a bodybuilder. Uh, I had a lot of relationships. And so, and my buddy, uh, uh, Joe, I'm sure you know Joe Bennett, hypertrophy coach. He, he still makes fun of me uh, from time to time about rolling around the Arnold with a suitcase uh, full of rice and grinds. And I'm just, I went to the, I went to the, um, the powerhouse, yeah, powerhouse gym. And I, I was like handing out bags. Nobody knew what the hell it was, right? Uh, I think the first bags I gave were to, to Jason Poston and uh, Reagan Grimes. Um, and then I went to see uh, my buddy Chris Tuttle at Animal. Um, at, th at that time, I'd had the digestive issue. So with him and I were in communication because obviously he's uh, really good at what he does in regards to you know, nutrition. And so I gave, gave some to him, gave some to uh, John Jewett and Evan and I think even uh, – uh, Derek. And so that was the, the start of it. I did a, a one of John Meadows' seminars there uh, at, that he had at the hotel and uh, went to Bullfrog Nutrition, set up a table there. So I was hustling, right? And um, that was the coming out party for, for Pride um, because of my contacts in, in the industry and in the retail side of things to kind of help spark things to get going. Um, we got back. My wife had already, she'd taken a position. She works for uh, Anheuser-Busch. And so she had taken a, uh, she got a promotion. So she literally came down here. My mother-in-law was there. I got back. The moving company wouldn't take the, the rice and grounds because, you know, whatever the, their rules are. So I had to load it on the box truck as they're moving our entire house, bring the box truck up, unload it into a house that's just a mess. Just utterly a mess my wife was like you have to wait at least one day to go live with the website and here i don't know anything i don't know anything about packaging i don't know i don't i don't build websites i don't know website design i had a, a buddy of mine that just came through at the last minute clutch with that did a phenomenal job still we're still operating off of that website met him at nutrex he used to work there um and we went live the second day we're in oklahoma with uh you know, a, a newborn still, she was less than, you know, about a year old maybe. And uh, yeah, and we haven't looked back ever since. And we, we operated out of the house for about a year and a half, a year and a half, a three car garage, got uh, racks from Lowe's. I would, and I would get pallets delivered to a residential area, sometimes like 15 of them, break them down, put them in the house. And then my daughter's playroom slash office, she calls it her office, is uh, that was our packing area. I had it set up there and, and, uh, didn't do nothing but you know figuring it out as as we went uh and was this uh 2019 then when when in pride launched yep i put the order in in late 2018 and we got we got it march of 2019 and we launched like last week of march first week of april of 2019 cool, yeah so cool. coming up on our three-year mark excellent so um just a a question here I, and I know just from uh, being a consumer of, of, of uh, your products and stuff, I know 2020 was a kind of a, a tough year. There was a little bit, I think, of some, some hiccups. Um, but when did you kind of know, Sean? Because like stepping into entrepreneurship is, is it's, it's, it's unlike anything else. And I think because you, uh, you know, were an elite bodybuilder, if you can kind of grasp the concept of like, you know, being a, a professional bodybuilder, being a top amateur there, I think there could be some correlation. There are some 
similarities in terms of entrepreneurship, because as a bodybuilder, you can look at it as sure. an entrepreneur, right? So I don't know if you ever thought about that or not, but when did you kind of know at what point, or maybe you haven't even reached that point yet in your mind, but has there been a point where you kind of like, okay, this is launched, uh, you know, the ball is rolling and, and we're, we're going to make it like this, this, this is going to, this is going to come through. Ha have you had that moment? Can you remember that moment? If so, share that with us, please. Sure. That's a good analogy. I, I actually hadn't thought about that kind of as the progression, right? Graduation into that. Um, I think we're in it, to be honest with you. And uh, I would absolutely love it if I could share with you our next product that we're, we did a, um, we're doing R&D on and that, I mean, we're this close to launching because I think that's the product that's really going to be like, you know, so we're innovating here. I'm, I'm not I'm, like people ask, well, you're going to do protein, you're going to do this, and that, like the vitamins, whatever, you know, there's, there's enough of those. Like I'm trying to, I want, I want to innovate. I've always been different for whatever reason. I want to continue to be different. Um, and I don't want to copycat what everybody else is, is, is doing. Not to say that's a bad thing or, or what have you. There, a lot of them are doing phenomenal and I'm happy for them. I want to do something different. So the next product um, is another innovative product. Um, and so that I think is going to be the, another big aha moment, if you will, kind of like graduating. Uh, if it does well, when it does, when it does well, when it does well, but uh, to be true, to truth be told, that moment, I think, is when I say we're in it, it has to be right now because last year was rough, right? Uh, I, placed, I placed an order with our manufacturer. Now, mind you, I don't have any supply issues. My bags are sourced here in the U.S. now. All Everything else is here. In the, I don't have a supply issue. I had a line issue. Um, we outgrew the manufacturer, if you will. Uh, and I wouldn't sacrifice. So there, there, let me put this out there. I could have done certain things, whether it bag myself, move the manufacturer and like kept the flavor the same, but obviously would have been tasted completely different, deceiving the, the, the customers, if you will. There, there could have been a, a, a few things I could have done to keep the, the cash flow and keep sales, but I just wouldn't sacrifice. I'm just not going to do it, man. Pride stands for something, obviously the acronym. And I just wouldn't do it. So I had to teach myself some patience last year. But I placed the order in 2020 of Oct 20, October 20th of 2020. We're still receiving some of that. Um, just a little part of it. And then April. And we're, we're finally, I literally have a full warehouse now. We have more coming next week. Um, we're getting ready to launch in Canada distribution. We're going to uh, uh, replenish our GCC partners in the Middle East. And so uh, we're starting to move in the right direction. But it was... It was, uh, we, we got down twice in this warehouse, I got down to a pallet. So we can hold roughly, and I have both sides now, we have two units. I can hold roughly at max, maybe 300 pallets. If I'm, if I'm like on the ground, double stacking, maybe even more. We were down to a pa half a pallet. One time we were down to a few boxes of peanut butter. And then Alfonso, uh, I can't call him my, my, my warehouse guy because he does so much more than that. But our employee Alfonso um, works in the warehouse. He reminded me that, it's like, Sean, we were down to like a half a pallet of strawberry banana. That was it. And so I was in that moment to where like, um, I felt like the orders were placed. I felt that we were going to be all right, but just it was one thing to be all right. And there's one thing to grow and scale, right? Where, where I see the company, where we're taking the company is, is to scale. And so that was kind of like getting a little uncomfortable. We started getting product in. And this is where it started to accumulate your, your question, the answer to your question. We had you know, lost maybe some market share. Our customers may have went here. You know, we, I was always outspoken. I was always upfront as much as I could. Um, I always try to keep it playful. I always made fun of myself, right, um, for these situations. And I was still worried, are we going to get the customers back, right? Because you, you can lose those customers. And we got our inventory back. We launched some new flavors. And they, I mean, the numbers are going up, right? Sales are going up. And now we're going, going again. So having them come back, they're not upset. They're not frustrated. And sure, some people are, but overall, the experience, the customer experience, is still good. And we put those things in place uh, for for a reason. That's when I was like, okay, right, loyal customers. They're they're buying into the brand. They're buying into us and what we're trying to do here. And they say that. That's not coming from me. They say that to us. That's when I was like, okay, all right. Which which in turn kind of instilled a responsibility in me. Like, hey, like I don't care if you don't have you don't know what you're doing. Get your shit together. 
right? I don't care. It's not an excuse anymore. It's your responsibility, right? People were counting on you. So uh, yeah, I'm kind of, I'm in that, I'm in that, that, that position now where we're getting, we're answering that question. Excellent. And, and just to be, uh, as you've been very open and transparent with us and, and myself, Sean, um, like I, I mean, I, I love the products. I've been ordering them for, uh, for quite a while now, well over a year, year and a half. Um, and like, you know, you got on your Instagram and you were very candid. You were very open. You kept it real with everybody. It's like, Hey, like this, this, this is where we're at. And, you know, I, I mean, cause like I was in prep from January of last year up until I competed in October. And like, I mean, this was my main carb source. And it's like, then when, when there was uh you know, the, the issue that you guys had, and I, I, I just always stuck to the unflavored. Cause if I'm going to flavor anything, I'll do it myself. Cause I've had some digestive issues myself. And I just, you know, I was just like, I do the unflavored. So then you didn't have the unflavored for the longest time. I was like, man, and then I was like, okay, I've got to try to figure out the cream of rice. Cause it sits well with my stomach, but then you get the generic stuff. Like you said, it has all the iron and all the other additives. I'm like, man, uh, so, you know, whatever, we made it through all that. Um, but I was looking around, it's like they, they, the other companies that are out there that you see on social media, they're, they're putting stuff in it that, that I personally don't want to put in my body. Right. So sure. what, my point is, is I was looking around, we <coughs> made it through, um, but I'm one of those people that came back as soon as you guys said, Hey, like this is back and this is back in stock. I was like, uh, I'm back and I'm, I'm, uh, you know, a, a very supportive customer now. But I'm just Thank saying you. that because like I was one of those people, I was, I was going to try to go somewhere else and go here and there, but it's like, you know what, I'm going to go back to pride because like, I just really <clears throat> value and appreciate what you guys are doing as a, as a company, as a brand. I mean, the, uh, the, the delivery service, how quick you guys ship it out. It's like, I place an order and it seems like within 30 minutes, I'm getting a, uh, you know, that follow-up email in terms of like, Hey, your order is, has shipped. I'm like, Whoa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it's here. I'm up in Iowa. It's here within usually two days. So, um, I, I just say that to say, I was one of those people I was going to try to look around. Then it's like, as soon as you guys got, uh, kind of going in the right direction again, I was back and I'm going to stay because I, again, I appreciate what you guys are doing. I value uh, the product and you, um, not willing to compromise. Cause that's what a lot of people do in the supplement industry just in life in general, they compromise yeah. um, to make the money. But you know what? I think you're going to find um, as you stay true to who you are and, and, and uh, the, the brand and the company, like, man, it's, it's only going to be that much greater, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that too. I mean, that like, okay, you're one person, right? But that's our, our customer base is made up of a bunch of one persons. And those, those, those messages, I'm telling you, man, it's, it's me. It's Alfonso. My wife works when she can. My wife, my, my daughter does some pictures, you know, and, and she's in marketing. But that's that's what we have. And I'm fortunate to have uh, a few people that, that work on contract remotely, website built, you know, stuff like that. My mentor, Mark, me. But outside of that, man, we're a small business. So those things, they're home runs for us. They, they mean so much that I'm telling you, man, they, I appreciate it. I appreciate the support. Not just, you know, saying this on the podcast. Like, I, I see your orders come through. I, I'm just still that weird guy that I, the orders come through. I'm like, okay, who's that? Where are they from? Right. I look at almost everything. So uh, it means a lot. And, and I'm, I'm glad it's one of those things that investments pay off. Right. And so those things that we did not sacrificing, they're paying off. And it's, it's, it's good to see because it, it backs up those hard times that we went through to, you know, to get to where we are now. Very cool. All right, Sean. So we're going to, we're going to wrap it up here. I've got one final question for you and then I'll kind of give you uh, the platform just to share anything that you would like to share um, in closing. Um, going back to bodybuilding because this is behind the muscle, right? And um, I think you would probably say still at heart, you're, you're a bodybuilder. You're probably always going to be um, you know, following obviously with the product that you have with Pride. Um, it's all over the bodybuilding fitness industry and community. So um, in terms of bodybuilding, what, what, what do you think or what do you know bodybuilding has given you or or what has it taught you in terms of life in terms of uh, fatherhood in terms of just being uh, a human being hmm. good question the a few things the one thing that I've, I've really rather enjoyed 
that I didn't have growing up is, is a network, is, is, is a, and I'm not going to call them a family, but a community, if you will, right? Um, I was actually watching your, your podcast with, with Chris Tuttle and uh, him. Uh, so my wife works with, with uh, his wife and we've become friends. And if we go to Texas, we'll you know, try to hang out and stuff and just s- small relationships like that. I made from, from, from all over the, the U.S. and even outside of the, the globe as well. Um, and just, it could be a friendship, but also like business things. Like I was, Chris would reach out to me with some stuff that he's got going on and I'll reach out to him. And it's just, it's nice to have that, that community, but also we, we have the, uh, sometimes when we start talking about certain things, we, from the bodybuilding, we had that mindset. So we kind of know where we're coming from, we're going and stuff like that. Um, so that's been, that's been quite, quite interesting because the, even and then there's there's so many guys and you know even some girls I could talk about that I've met and so I won't go in, in detail there but that's been that's been fun and that's been um, rewarding as well especially in an industry where it can be self-absorbed um, narcissistic right we can go down the list of the the negative attributes of bodybuilding easily um, so it's been nice to kind of sift through those things and, and get a good community of people um, personally. Um, <clears throat> I go back to the, the work ethic thing, putting in the work and, and, and getting it back. And I think it's very important because it was on a small, let's say small scale, but it's within myself, right? And that's the, the number one thing. So it, it wasn't mentally or spiritually, it was physically. And we went, through, we went through mental toughness with bodybuilding, but you went through this physical thing where you could transform and you put all the work into it and you could see it. Maybe you're so, you're, you're like me and you're, you know, a head case, you couldn't see it day in and day out. So you, you know, I stayed covered up always, like when I was training, always hoodie, I don't care if it's hundred degrees outside, but you start looking at the check engine, like you're changing, you're, you're putting this in. And so now as I'm older and uh, a father and trying to um, kind of unpack some of the stuff that from my childhood, I look at mentally. Now I, I'm like, okay, I need to put the work in myself, whether it's spiritually, mentally, things like that so that I can make progress as well, so that my daughter doesn't have to do that, right? Or, you know, and any of the kids and create a better life and environment for my family. And, the, and now that we're going to start having, you know, employees and pride's going to start growing, well, that can positively impact them as well. So I think one of the big things that I haven't mentioned yet that bodybuilding has, you know, led me to now with pride is, is leadership, right? A, a big thing is, is leadership. And you know, I, I'm, I'm not the greatest leader because I've always been like, oh, it's just me in my corner. I'll do the, but being uh, as a father, you're a leader. As a husband, you are a leader. And so um, it's giving me that confidence that I can uh, in turn utilize to be a great leader in my, for my daughter, in my family, uh, here at Pride, in my community. Um, and then again, what Pride stands for, right? I want to be a, a leader with the company. I want to lead by example. I want to provide a very, very high quality product as well. Um, so I, I, I would be hard pressed to say that it would be where I am now with the mentality that I have now. Um, if it weren't for, for the things that um, I've acquired, right? The, the attributes that I've acquired through the process of bodybuilding. Um, so the trophies, they're great. That's cool. I tried to throw them away. My wife wouldn't let me. A uh, funny story, uh, during the whole shutdown, my, my daughter's at home and we're running out of stuff for her to paint. And so she looks at one of my trophies and says, can I, can I paint daddy? Because she thought it was me. And I said, well, yeah, sure. So every one of my trophies, including my nationals trophies, is just whatever color she decided, to, literally every one of them. Um, and it's not that they don't mean anything to me, right? But what they, what, the meaning of that they represent is more what I have internally. Um, and so, yeah, that's I definitely would uh, have to attribute a lot of the, um, the attributes and success that we have um, because of the things that we've learned through the process of bodybuilding. I love it, man. I, that's why I enjoy this podcast just to get behind the muscle because um, I truly believe that bodybuilding teaches us so much more than just, you know, uh, how to count sets and reps. There's, there's a lot of depth within bodybuilding in terms of life lessons, if you're open to it. Right. So, uh, yeah, so Sean, that's, that's, that's the that? most important part. You took the words out of my mouth. If you're open to it. Right. So yeah. like early on, I had no idea. Sorry to interrupt you, but I, oh, no, you're that's, good. That's, you're good. 
that's the most important thing, mm-hmm. right? Early on, and even even until like I was done bodybuilding, essentially, like I, I I just wasn't. It was my daughter who like I realized like oh, I need to open, you know, I need to get to that, right? And then I started realizing all the things that I have learned and that have been beneficial. But being open to it. So anybody listening, right? Like if you you got some stuff that you need to pack, some bags you need to unpack, and you're you know that you have the tools. What the the analogy I always use is. I, I, I was fortunate to have the hardships that I had, right? Because they, they, they teach you so many things. The problem that accompanies you know, a childhood like mine, the things that I went through that happened to me, whatever they are, is that it gives you all the tools, but it completely just fucks the toolbox. So uh, there may be a, a, a job that needs a hammer, or sorry, a job that needs uh, a skill saw or needs a, uh, you know, something precise, all I know is a hammer. I just grab a hammer. I've got the tool, but I just grab a hammer. And so as I'm older and trying to be more wise now, I realize like, okay, I need to organize my tools and then use them appropriately, right? Because that's the real tragedy. The real tragedy if I, is that if I have all these tools and the skill sets and then I use none of them to better myself and my community, that's the real tragedy. And so you have to be open to it. Good point. For sure, for sure. So Sean, uh... Before uh, we wrap it up here, uh, I first of all, I just want to say thank you for being candid, man. Thank you for opening up and sharing maybe some stuff that you haven't really uh, put out there a lot in terms of a podcast or an interview or social media. So um, for me, man, I, I, I really appreciate that. I know uh, the listeners, the, the viewers are going to find great value in that too. So um, before I do the outro here, Sean, um, if you do have any final thoughts, any final words, if there's anybody that you want to um, shout out or anything you want to talk about in terms of pride, anything we need to keep our eyes out for on um, the platform is yours. And then I'll, I'll uh, close us out. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you, you having me on. Um, it's been, it's been fun. I've been wanting to get into more of this and we have a table being built so I can start doing some with, with pride as well. Cause as you know, it's, you know, social media, YouTube, that whole you know brand building thing is very important. Um, so this is kind of this help me kind of get get that uh, moving in a positive direction and, and and make some progress. But um, yeah, you know the circle that I have is small. I'm grateful for them. Um, they they know who they are. Um, I, I try to make it known to them. Um, but uh, my wife has been, you know, uh, as bodybuilding has been one of the big reasons that I'm able to be where I am right now. I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention uh, her, right? She's been stubborn enough to stick by me as I'm trying to uh, help a lost young boy find his find his way, if you will, and un- unpack some stuff. So she's been, um, you know, whether if you're spiritual or not, whatever, she's a blessing, right? I'm, and I'm, I'm very grateful for her. Um, but um, yeah, so we've got some new stuff coming very, very soon. Uh, the listeners that are customers, I want to thank you guys for, uh, like yourself, sticking around and uh, affording us the opportunity to to get you back as customers as we went through those hardships. I promise I'm working to to not repeat that as well. Um, having some difficult conversations with some people and kind of you know force to keep my finger on the pulse, if you will. Uh, but we also are innovating. We have some new stuff coming that I think you're going to be uh, super excited about. You can the website is pridefoods.org. Our Instagram is the Pride Foods. Uh, mine is deepride.sb, uh, but Deep Pride Foods, uh, we'll, we'll update everybody there um, with our awesome memes that I, that I make. Um, but yeah, man, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just grateful to be, to be where I am now and to be working uh, on making progress with the company, with myself, my community, my family. And uh, if anybody ever has any questions or concerns or comments or anything, they can get a hold of me through social media. Uh, we're pretty responsive on there. And um, uh, I look forward to interacting and answering questions and providing more product and, and, and a good service in the future. Very cool. All right, Sean. Uh, thank you so much, man. I, I really appreciate the, the candid conversation. Okay. Yes, sir. Appreciate you. For Have sure. a good one. Uh, so all of those uh, of you who are tuning into another episode of Behind the Muscle Podcast, I just want to say uh, thank you to you because if it wasn't for you, the podcast wouldn't exist. Everything is uh, growing steadily and strongly. And I just uh, am so appreciative of all of you who continue to subscribe to us on YouTube, follow us on Instagram and just support.
the podcast through sharing it on your social media, commenting on YouTube and, and all the things. So uh, thank you again for tuning into this episode with Sean of Behind the Muscle Podcast. If you haven't done so already, make sure you go to YouTube. If you're on YouTube right now and you haven't done so already, make sure you hit that subscribe button. That's really important because I release all of these episodes first on YouTube, and then I will distribute them to the other podcast platforms. So if you want to stay current on all the Behind the Muscle podcast episodes, make sure you are subscribed to us on YouTube. And then one uh, final favor I'd ask all of you, please take this episode with Sean and share it on your Instagram stories. Make sure you tag Sean, tag, uh, beh uh, tag Behind the Muscle, and then also tag pride food so that we know you listened to this episode specifically and found great value in it, which I know you did. And then finally, I will leave you all with this. Remember behind the muscle, there's always a story. We'll catch you guys later.